Let's take a look at this phenomenon called enzyme inhibition using my cute little buddies right here. So here I have an enzyme, here's another enzyme. Let's start here on the left uh, with an example of competitive inhibition. So here is my enzyme. Now this enzyme is actually a complex protein made up of a chain of amino acids folded into a complex three-dimensional structure, but that's okay. It's cute like this. So here's a little enzyme, and normally here's its substrate that it's supposed to bind to. And when it's doing its job, it's nice and happy. And it goes, blah, 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 and this gets converted to its products, and it leaves, and another one can come along, and it can keep on doing that. So what's an inhibitor? Well, an inhibitor is something that's going to prevent this enzyme from doing its job. So in this case, competitive inhibition is where you have some kind of molecule that is very similar in shape to the substrate, and it can actually bind to the same active site. And when it binds to that active site, he's surprised now. Now the normal substrate cannot actually bind and so you should expect the enzyme reaction to decrease. That's pretty easy to understand. In competitive inhibition, an inhibiting molecule is structurally, structurally similar to the substrate and so it's actually binding directly to the active site and causing this to not work out. In non-competitive inhibition, here's another guy right here. Here's his active site. Here's the regular substrate that's supposed to come in. And when it binds, it's very happy. It goes blah, 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 and then does its job and it gets converted to its products and leaves and another one comes in, so on and so forth. Now, in non-competitive inhibition, in this case, you might say, okay, I'm just, uh, this is very a simplified idea here. But this inhibitor doesn't actually fit into this site here. This inhibitor actually binds to another location on the enzyme. That enzyme may not have intended to have another spot there, but it just so happens that whatever this is, this poison, can actually bind in another location. And when it binds to this other location, it actually causes the whole enzyme to change shape. He becomes kind of unhappy and actually affects the actual uh, site of the, the actual active site where the normal substrate is supposed to bind. So because of this guy binding here at a site that is not the active site, that's very important. This inhibitor in non-competitive inhibition binds to a site that is not the active site and as a, as a result of binding causes a conformational change to happen to the uh, structure of the active site and then now the normal substrate cannot actually go in and bind. So that's it. Those are the main differences between competitive and non-competitive inhibition. And I'm going to give you a couple examples here in a second. So non-competitive inhibition, one more time. An inhibitor binds to an enzyme not on the active site. It causes a conformational change in the active site and therefore a decrease in the activity. So here are two specific uh, examples here. And you should know some examples. You don't have to choose these ones. but. Um, Here's an enzyme, it's called succinate dehydrogenase, and then take a look at what it's supposed to do. It sounds like it takes succinate and it dehydrogenates it. In other words, it removes hydrogen and turns it into fumarate. So take a look here. There's succinate, compare it to fumarate, and uh, it's actually got two less hydrogen atoms. All right, fine. That's what this enzyme is supposed to do. Now. Uh, the enzyme is here in the middle. Uh, I should bring that guy down. Uh, anyways, okay, here's the enzyme right here. Um, succinate can bind to the active site, but unfortunately malinate, and this is easy to remember because mal sounds bad. Malinate has a structure very similar to succinate, and so malinate can actually bind to this enzyme um, in the active site, and when this is actually bound, the succinate can't actually bind to the enzyme as it's supposed to, and therefore cannot be converted to fumarate. So uh, this is an example of competitive inhibition where malinate is binding competitively sorry is competing for the exact same active site so this over here is an example of competitive inhibition so a little bit about succinate dehydrogenase this is important in uh, mitochondria this is a picture of mitochondria with a little cutout and there's actually a disease called lee syndrome lee syndrome which actually when you have uh, succinate dehydrogenase not functioning properly, um, you end up with very low energy levels because mitochondria is important for producing energy. Okay, so that's the example of competitive inhibition. Now for an example of non-competitive inhibition, um, this one's a little more obscure as an example, but arginine uh, gets converted to something called citrulline and nitric oxide. 
and this enzyme nitric oxide synthase can be comp can be non-competitively <gasps> mouthful non-competitively inhibited by opioids so the opioids can actually bind to the enzyme and a, a site that is not the active site causes this enzyme to change shape and the arginine is not going to be able to bind to the active site like it's supposed to because this guy has caused its change uh, the, the shape of the active site to change so nitric oxide synthase okay remember every enzyme usually ends in ASC synthase is inhibited by opioids uh, through something called allosteric inhibition we're going to see this in more detail uh, later but for now allosteric inhibition is uh, synonymous with non-competitive inhibition and if you must know nitric oxide synthase is an enzyme that plays many signaling pathway roles so those are your examples of competitive and non-competitive inhibition now let's take let's go one step further and take a look at two graphs here um, you're gonna have to study these in detail and then go back and look at some of the examples let me try to do this really quickly for you in competitive inhibition notice that if I increase the substrate concentration eventually I can overcome I can overcome the effect of the inhibitor so notice that with no inhibitor everything goes fine with the inhibitor present the reaction rate seems a little bit lower but if I increase the number of the amount of the proper substrate the concentration of the proper substrate I can actually end up with the result that's almost like the inhibitor is not really affecting anything and if you think about that um, it's like going back to here and saying if we have a whole bunch of these guys okay and these are binding um, if I actually have a high enough concentration of these guys here they can out compete out compete these guys okay so if I increase this concentration high enough I can out compete um, the actual competitive inhibitor here that's trying to get to the same site and so I can overcome its effect by just increasing the substrate concentration um, it'll overcome the effects of the inhibitor because they're binding to the same spot so you can see that here in this graph over here though for non-competitive inhibition you can see here with no inhibitor everything's fine and dandy but with the competitor it's lower as expected but even at very high substrate concentrations I can't seem to overcome the effect as I would in competitive inhibition so let's illustrate that here really quick um, turn this guy into an infinite cloner and we have a bunch of these guys as well too so um, if I increase the concentration of these guys over here it doesn't really matter because as long as one of these guys is bound here these guys aren't be, going to be able to come in and fit so it doesn't matter how many of these actual substrates I produce they're not competing for the same spot this can't come fit over here and these will not come fit over here so you can't overcome the effect of a non-competitive inhibitor that's basically what these two graphs are showing and then here's some writing to help you uh, process that a little bit more as well too okay I think that is a good enough well it's good enough for me hopefully it's good enough for you to help you understand how Inhibitor, inhibitors work with enzymes and the clear difference between competitive and non-competitive inhibition. We're going to take a look at allosteric inhibition, which is a specific example of non-competitive inhibition a little bit later in the next video. So uh, stay tuned. Thank you very much.